I'm Portia Young. Welcome to the July edition of 1036. In this episode, Sandy Max takes us on a trip to space. Well, sort of. And we'll hear about some visually exciting news coming to Milwaukee Sherman Park neighborhood. We begin with a fascinating look at the discovery of dozens of human graves outside a Milwaukee homeless shelter and the two-year archaeological endeavor that followed. What remains reminds us of Milwaukee's history and religious and ethnic heritage. These remains also remind us all why these souls buried here centuries ago should never really be forgotten. In the summer of 2015, human remains were discovered in a lot next to the guest house during the construction of an addition at the Shelter for Homeless Men on North 13th Street in Milwaukee. Under state law, the guest house was responsible for having the remains excavated under the guidance of the Wisconsin Historical Society. The Historical Society asked archaeological students and faculty from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to take on the complicated work of excavation and examination. Professor Patricia Richards led the team. We agreed to have an archaeological monitor on site to make sure that uh, their project would um, not disturb anything, so we did. We sent an archaeological monitor out to the site, um, and they began excavation, and immediately, within the first two hours, encountered human remains on the site. So at that point, the State Historical Society was contacted, and we um, worked a contract out with the State Historical Society with the guest house uh, and with UW-Milwaukee's Cultural Resource Management Services to provide archaeological services to the guest house to remove the uh, burials. Richards and her team quickly established the burials were from the mid-19th century, before Wisconsin was a state, before Milwaukee was much more than an outpost for traders and a swampy settlement on the verge of becoming a major American city. But more specifically, they asked, who are these people buried here? And where did they come from? Only archaeological best practices can unlock the secrets of our past, as this team of experts delicately and thoughtfully work through this compelling process. What we see when, when we work with human remains, and, and I think that is absolutely true of everybody in our program, is we see an individual each and every time. And regardless of, of whether someone agrees with our perspective or not, with whether they think it should have been excavated, not excavated, whether it should have been disturbed or not disturbed, the reality is urban development is urban development. And this kind of thing is going to happen. And so we feel very strongly that what we do, what, and what we do very ethically, is we, we provide that voice for that individual. And in many instances, we don't have a name, but we can say this person is of this descent, they lived for this long, they, their, their, their bones reflected these activities, um, someone buried them with, with these kinds of things. This is this person. Um, and we do so very, in a very respectful manner in the sense of, yes, they are people. They're not, they're not collections to us. We don't refer to these people as, you know, the collection. Um, they're individuals. There's a lot of history, you know, in Milwaukee, specifically in the United States. A lot of hard, hard times. And people, you know, don't deserve to be forgotten. And it's the highest calling that we can do to, to treat these guys properly. As far as history is concerned, this area of land was known as the Second Ward Cemetery, also the German Protestant Cemetery, and sometimes called Grunhagen Cemetery, named after settler and businessman John F. Grunhagen, who purchased several acres of the land back in the 1840s. Grunhagen came from the Pomerania region of Europe before it became part of Germany. These Pomeranian immigrants were called the Old Lutherans, who arrived between 1839 and 1845, after the King of Prussia, once part of Germany, tried to unite the Lutheran and Reformed faiths. By 1874, Milwaukee wanted everyone out of this cemetery. These discovered graves most likely belonged to families who couldn't afford to move them. The argument that many cities used at that time was that it was unhealthy to have cemeteries close to the settlement of humans, which is an absurd argument, but it was an argument that was used. The real reason is that they had it in mind to plat that area and sell those lots off. Also by this time, Grunhagen Cemetery was gone from plat maps. 
and changes started to take place. The maps are found at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. The curator of that collection is Marcy Bidney. The earliest map that we have here that we've looked at was from 1856. And we can see very clearly that uh, this parcel of property is pretty much on the edge of what Milwaukee, the size of Milwaukee was. We looked at, we look at maps all the way then up to 1894. And we can see then how the, the city is growing west. I mean, we have uh, a good time series of these maps that show us how the city grew. In fact, most of the Pomeranian immigrants settled west of the Milwaukee River in southern Ozaukee County in a town called Freistadt, which means free city in German. Freistadt now lies within the city of Mequon. Many of these people were considered the old Lutherans. A small group of them settled in the Second Ward, where they became isolated and separated somehow from the Freistadt settlement. Direct descendants of the original settlers of this area and the early Milwaukee settlement still gather every year in Freistadt to celebrate their common heritage. Professor Richards confirmed the people buried in the Second Ward Cemetery were religious refugees and associated with the Pomeranian community. However, she emphasized, they expressed a personal and not a religious identity. Richard says with a larger sample, the results might have been different. We found not a single bit of religious paraphernalia at all, nothing. This was not a religious cemetery, so, so that was not the reason people were being, were choosing to be buried in the cemetery. So they were choosing to be buried there likely because it, of the location. This and other conclusions resulted from a very elaborate and delicate process. First, in the field. Uncovering each body involved digging down and boxing out each grave, then working closer to the body with wooden tools, careful not to damage the bones. The archaeologists had to cover segments of the body not being worked on so as not to dry them out in the summer heat. They carefully removed dirt from around the body, uncovering hands, feet, and the pelvis last. The remains were documented and then lifted out. Professor Richard says it took a day to a day and a half of work for each body. But the work didn't end there. We were invited into the laboratory at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee to follow the workflow and witness the care and attention to detail given to these mortal remains. The young archaeologists delicately handled fragile, brittle puzzle pieces, matching them until they fit into recognizable forms of human anatomy. The very few material bits found with the bones also help identify and define the individual narratives. Project manager, Katherine Jones. And we bring them back to our lab for a stable environment. And so what we do is we like to go through and establish some demographics for them. So that's how old they were when they died, what sex they were, any pathology, which is diseases that may have affected them during their life, any traumas that they went through. And then if we can to see um, what ancestry they may have shared. So we go through a series of standard uh, methods and evaluations. We do some measurements. We do some um, visual evaluation of those things and see what we can come up with. This process revealed no specific identification of individuals and no DNA matching to living ancestors. The DNA is unstable, having been exposed to the soil and other elements. Gathering more detail would be beyond the scope of this particular project and too costly in time and expense. In total, the UWM team recovered 53 adults and 28 juveniles from 74 burial sites. Of the adults for whom sex could be determined, 42 are males, 39 females. We have very few old people, like maybe five people over the age of 50 in this cemetery. Again, it's not representative, I think, of the cemetery as a whole. But it is remarkable that we have mostly young and middle-aged adults. Evidence of physical stress, 
broken bones, including ankle injuries, and age were the most prevalent among the adult population, while infection and nutritional deficiency more heavily affected the juveniles. Young women um, show a lot more of what we call degenerative joint disease, which is um, the, the kind of thing that's associated with very hard labor, particularly carrying heavy things. And you see that in the lower lumbar vertebra. You see it in the knees. Um, you, you tend to see it um, uh, even in, in um, uh, arms and legs to a certain extent. Um, so m men perhaps living a little bit more dangerous kind of existence in terms of things they're doing daily. Women just working really, really, really hard. The real dichotomy between the youngsters and, and the adults with regard to nutritional stresses. I mean, I guess I wasn't expecting it to be quite so dramatic with the kids and almost absent with the adults. Um, and that just tells us a lot about immigrants, I think, and, and the immigrant experience a little bit and the fact that People came here for a variety of reasons, perhaps not really understanding the impact it was going to have on that on that next generation. And how would they? I mean, you're not going to know what they can, you know, what they expect necessarily. Um, so that was surprising. Richard says it's very likely younger individuals were exposed to new diseases and inadequate medical care, which also affected newly arrived immigrant groups. As Professor Richards writes her formal report for the Wisconsin Historical Society. She reflects on those forgotten souls from the Second Ward Cemetery. When you have an urban area that is that, that changes rapidly and, and you have different groups of people living in that area who have ties to it, but they move on, and that happens in urban areas, of course, and the nature of the neighborhoods change. The cemeteries, that link between the, the living and the dead, that, that link is so easily broken. And when there's no physical sign of it, then really what ends up happening is those folks are, are forgotten. Humans really need that link to their past. And I think that if the link isn't personal, it should at least be, it should be cultural or it should be social in some way. And I think we're all a little bit less um, human every time those links are broken. We want to point out that key supporters of the guest house helped with the initial $200,000 excavation costs. The State Historical Society will inform the shelter on any future costs should a reinternment be necessary. The guest house says they just want to do what's right and to treat people living or deceased with dignity and respect. The individuals excavated from the cemetery are housed at UWM's Archaeological Research Laboratory. Professor Richard says the Wisconsin Historical Society's decision process on final disposition could take years. We're approaching the one-year anniversary of the unrest in Milwaukee Sherman Park neighborhood. Over the last year, many in and around this diverse neighborhood have been working hard to reinforce the positive. One community artist has an idea to help residents embrace their vision of what they want their beloved community to be. Joining us now is that artist, Tia Richardson. Thank you for joining us here on 1036. Thank you for having me. Okay, Tia, let's start with the idea and how it came about. It came, the idea was to do a mural and it came about through a series of brainstorming sessions or creative workshops that I had with the community to talk about what they're interested in. Okay, were there any concerns or main themes that emerged from those brainstorming sessions? Mm -hmm. Every Everyone had their, their own individual issue that they were concerned with. Mm -hmm. um, so some of them ranged from literacy to uh, unemployment and housing and um, the systemic issues and justice, social issues. So there was a way for everybody to share what they wanted and um, put it all together into something that was unified. Were some of the residents sensitive to what happened to perhaps mar the image of Sherman Park? Mm -hmm. um, everyone, everyone had their own relationship to what happened and um, everybody was cooperative in terms of um, wanting to stick with this idea of doing a mural that, that captures those feelings 
-hmm. while also acknowledging the healing that's taking place and the work that is being done currently and for many years to address some of those issues. Okay. So let's talk about that, the power of a mural and the symbolism in particular involved in this representation. So the power in this particular process was the fact that everyone got to ha hear, have their voice heard mm -hmm. and be invited to work together or come on board with, with this central idea of unity and working together. That's the power of the process. And so the mural is a reflection of that. Right. And that has a powerful symbol in the community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, the, the central image is um, um, lifting the house as a community and um, the, the, the diversity of the, the community coming together to help lift mm -hmm the house which represents the community um, on, uh, and also represents the mind and uh, housing literally but you know um, on but different also figuratively but also figuratively mm -hmm. yeah so so there's so there's three central figures that are helping to lift with the support of the community help you know helping to that action to take place that's wonderful so that is the most powerful symbol for you inside the mural all of it is powerful for me, <laughs> right. but I had to pick one. Right. And so if I were to direct everyone to that center, that central image is about unity. I, I wanted to, to embody this idea of um, transcending, mm -hmm. transcending personal differences and ideology um, with the heart. So there's a picture of the heart that the, that the, that the peace lilies make in the middle. Um, so the heart of the community. And that's really showing the impact that something like this can have, the project itself can mm -hmm. have. Yeah. All right. Well, where did the funding for this project come from, if we could touch on that really quickly? Um, it's a beautification grant through provided through the City of Milwaukee Department of Neighborhood Services. That's wonderful. Okay, lastly, where can people see this beautiful work of art? 4715 West Center Street. Okay. Thank you very much, Tia Richardson, Thank you. the artist that helped make the mural. Thank Make you. it happen in Thank Sherman you. Park. Thank you. Such positive efforts are part of what we will be discussing in our August program, Beyond Sherman Park, a 1036 special. On July 27th, Milwaukee PBS and our partners at WUWM Public Radio will gather neighbors, community activists, as well as local and state leaders and local journalists to record this program. We will be talking about the underlying issues affecting Sherman Park and other communities and how to best move forward. If you're interested in being part of the audience, please go to milwaukeepbs.org and click on Beyond Sherman Park on the right side of the screen. The program will air August 10th at 8 p.m. right here on Milwaukee PBS. WUWM Radio will simulcast the program that evening. Did you ever dream of being an astronaut, floating in space, exploring the great beyond? Milwaukee PBS's Sandy Max got a special look inside NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston earlier this year. She participated in the program Hashtag NASA Social. It brings together people who share an interest in space exploration and using social media to spread the word. So Sandy took her wide-eyed enthusiasm, her cell phone, a selfie stick, and set out on a space adventure frame of mind. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station is ready. The morning started with a live interactive video session with the two American astronauts aboard the International Space Station, known as the ISS. On the five-story tall screen at Houston Space Center's theater, Peggy Whitson and Shane Kimbrough answered over a dozen questions about different aspects of living life in space for months at a time and the kinds of experiments they've been conducting. And I got to ask a question too. What is the brightest light, natural or man-made, that you can see from the ISS that's on Earth? Sorry, we're trying to figure that one out. That's a great question. Um, yeah, the, most of the big bright lights are in, in big cities, so there's nothing that stands out to me that I've seen and I'm like, oh yeah, that's that light or whatever. Uh, but it's all man-made, of course. The city as a whole kind of looks like, you know, the bigger ones are brighter than others. Um, sorry, I can't answer that one completely. <laughs> I'm kind of proud of myself. Stumped the, uh, stumped the ISS astronauts. Thanks so much. Keep up the great work. The rest of the day did not disappoint.
I got a personal tour of the Space Vehicle Mock-Up Facility, a massive warehouse of a building. Robots, rovers, and the Mars capsule Orion are all being developed there. Then I got to explore the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, where astronauts train for spacewalks in this famous huge pool. It's also where essential space gear is developed. As you can see by this sign, spacesuit technology has been incorporated into the modern sports world here on Earth in football helmets, athletic shoes, and other sportswear. The day went on to include a visit to mission control that's used today to communicate with the International Space Station and the mission control of yesterday, the very room where the Apollo 13 crew's famous message, Houston, we've had a problem, was received. One of the highlights of visiting the Space Vehicle Mock-Up Facility was seeing the work being done on the Orion capsule that will eventually take a crew to the planet Mars. You get a real perspective on the compact quarters of the capsule and how extremely efficient and organized the equipment is inside. Weightlessness on the ISS and in space travel is a phenomenon that astronauts have to prepare for in a variety of ways. The best way is in the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, a 6.2 million gallon pool where astronauts get close to an environment of zero gravity by going underwater wearing special suits. A replica of the ISS is in the pool and astronauts submerge for as long as eight hours at a time to learn how to take spacewalks and how to make repairs while suspended in outer space. The Neutral Buoyancy Lab is also where space suits are developed and I got to try some of the gear on. And I have the glove on. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about the glove, David. The glove has heaters in the very uh, tips of the fingers, and those are turned on via this switch right here. You pull this on, or you can pull it off. Okay. Cool. We have um, a palm bar, which is a rigidized bar in the palm here, in order to keep the glove from just ballooning out like a big balloon. And you can tighten that via this strap right here. And Think then we, of everything. Then we both go this back down. We have a tether loop right here that we can have what we call a re adjustable um, tether. So it's basically a strap with a hook on it that we can use to tether objects. So we can use that hook for this. And then inside here we have a harness and this connects to a wire that runs up the inside of your sleeve and then goes out to a battery on the suit that actually powers the glove heater. Just like David Barrett there of the Extravehicular Activity or EVA department, or astronaut Victor Glover you see here, everyone I met at NASA was willing to answer questions, from the very scientific to the one high on the curiosity list. But you're going to answer the burning question that everyone has. It takes hours to get in and out of this suit. So what happens when you have to go to the bathroom? When you gotta go, you gotta go, all right? This is a maximum absorbency garment, okay? It's gonna hold in whatever needs to be held in while you're in that suit. And now you know. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communication. I could have stayed in mission control and watched for hours how the NASA team communicates with the ISS and other space programs around the world. But there's something really special about the original mission control of the legendary space journeys of the 1960s. We started controlling missions since Gemini 4 in here, which is McDivitt and White. That was, a, that was the first spacewalk was by Ed White, first U.S. spacewalk, was controlled out of this room. And all the Apollo missions. Now, during the Apollo mission, during those early missions, there was a flag that hung right where that flag is. And all through Apollo 11 through Apollo 16, um, that, that same flag hung there, and then just before Apollo 17, Gene Cernan came and got it, and they, they put a different flag up, and Gene Cernan took that flag and planted it on the moon. So that's the one that's planted near the uh, uh, Apollo 17 landing site, is the flag that used to fly here. And this, he took this, uh, Gene Cernan took this flag as well to uh, inside the uh, uh, lunar lander, didn't go out on the surface of the moon, but has been to the moon. It's got moon dust in it. So Gene Cernan, when he delivered it to Mission Control, he said, this is my gift to uh, all those who got us to the moon and back safely. I left inspired in particular by the creative problem solving of this scientific community. Smart people who believe in science come together at NASA and in countries all around the world to collaborate on efforts like the International Space Station. The research that's being done at the ISS and in space travel benefits life here on Earth. 
So keep looking to the sky and dreaming about space. And if a NASA visit is on your bucket list, make it happen. You won't be sorry. To see more behind the scenes photos from Sandy's adventure and much more, log on to MilwaukeePBS.org and click 1036. That's it for the July edition of 1036. Another reminder, please watch Beyond Sherman Park, a 1036 special on August 10th at 8 p.m. right here on Milwaukee PBS. We leave you with some summer sights from above, Booth Lake in East Troy. <laughs>